Good luck. Hello everyone, welcome to the next in our series of our co-pilot webinars. Um, we are just going to give everyone just one more minute to to join us um, and then we'll be getting straight into it on getting the most out of your M365 co-pilot licenses with me and Anton. So one more moment and uh, we'll get started very shortly. OK, we're going to get started now. So welcome to those who've just joined. Um, this is the next in our series of webinars on Copilot, focusing in today on getting the most out of your M365 Copilot licenses. So you might have seen my face before or Anton's face, but just for those who haven't met us before, as by way of introduction, my name is Katie McCallum. Um, I've been at WM a long old time now, and I am an adoption and change capability lead here at WM. Um, I've got specialism in, in ACM and I've been working in that team for a long time, but also more widely than that, looking across modern workplace strategy and road mapping for our customers. Um, and this year, um, getting right in there, stuck in with Copilot and being one of our specialists in the Copilot capability within M365. And Anton is joining me. Hello everyone, um, my name is Anton and probably you've seen me on the previous series of the webinar. So I'm a technical lead at WM Reply and I'm looking after the architecture and development teams in WM. Um, my background coming from a um, software development world uh, and for sure this year I am same as Katie stuck into the um, happily in the M365 Copilot as one of my areas of focus. Great stuff. OK, so focusing in on what we're going to cover today, because you may have joined us on previous webinars. Um, oh, first of all, do ask questions as ever. Uh, we want to hear from you. So we're going to speak uh, for about half an hour um, or so, um, and then we will open the floor to questions. You can drop them into the chat, uh, the Q&A, as they do come into your head. So you don't have to hold them and remember them for the end and we'll publish those and then we will we'll come back to them at the end. Um, so please do remember that we want it to be a, an engaging session that you can ask your key questions to us as we go. OK, so focusing in on the agenda for today. So you will have um, some of you may have joined us for previous webinars um, where we've done some very focused sessions, whether it's on oversharing or creating a, a co-pilot champions community. We actually want to take a moment today on, on, on this session to zoom out um, and think about the key pillars and key considerations. So those are a little bit more detailed around, um, you know, key tactics or, or strategies when it comes to the co-pilot um, enablement. But we just want to give you guys an overview of all the key pillars that you should be considering. And each of these we think, you know, there's there's a there's definitely space for um, some planning, some three to six for 12 months planning on each of these. You don't have to be actively engaged in every pillar, um, but this is our recommended best practice for moving forward with Copilot and ensuring this fits for your organisation and you are set up for success and you don't have to roll back and you drive the relevant adoption. You make the case for Copilot moving forward and you plan for some of the extensibility features that we see coming down the track. So those are the key five areas that we're going to cover today. Um, and hopefully by the end of it, you'll have a really good grasp of uh, what you should be considering in your organisation, which of course we can help with at WM Reply. So we're going to move into the first pillar and spend a few minutes on that first. The first is around our technical readiness piece, and I'm going to hand over to Anton now to speak through that. Yeah, thanks, Katie. And um, I know we've done the technical readiness as a webinar before, and I think we've done a couple of a uh, couple of webinars about the technical readiness and different aspects of readiness, like addressing your uh, oversharing, looking at the permission settings on the tenant, but also looking into your risk and compliance and data governance across the tenant. So, what we would like to talk about today, with the lens of technical readiness, is how can technical readiness actually impact the effectiveness of the pilot and the cost of the pilot? So there are two main two main aspects why it is important in terms of effectiveness and utilization of your licenses during the pilot period. So first of all, as you may know, the cost of license for M365 Copilot is quite high 
is 30 US dollars, which equates roughly to 25 pounds a user a month. So imagine that you roll out your pilot, um, you buy 300 licenses, which is a, a minimum purchase today, um, and it will mean that one month of using those co-pilot licenses for 300 people will equate roughly to seven and a half thousand pounds. So what you would like to make sure is that by the time you're procuring licenses, you are actually ready to dive straight into the pilot to not be in a situation where the licenses um, have been procured, but at the same time, you are not clear yet with the ICT, ITSEC, uh, InfoSec departments in the organization, and you can't have a green light to start your pilot. So no one would like to pay seven and a half thousand for a month of downtime. So therefore, to make sure that you, you utilize in those licenses due, during trial period fully, you would absolutely like to make sure that before you procure license, you've done your technical readiness and you've cleared all the potential red flags, all the question marks and ticked all the boxes with ICT, with security and with legal departments. So that's number one. And then imagine that you can do this, but probably you think, OK, um, maybe I don't have to clear all the text tick boxes, right? Maybe I can get away with some of those um, kind of risk and compliance things not being done. Maybe you can ignore the sensitivity labeling or maybe you don't dive very deep into the uh, permissions or oversharing. You can address most of it, but not everything. And what we've seen, what we've heard actually from uh, some of the customers and from our partners at Microsoft, that there were cases where the pilot has been started but then people have organizations had to switch those licenses off because someone started to find and retrieve information that they were not supposed to or probably um, the legal department had a closer look into what uh, sensitivity labeling is applied to the content being generated or what content is being fed into the copilot so this can throw organization even further back than just um, kind of not doing, not uh, not enabling Copilot at day one, right? So you can actually have negative experience with your ICT, with the with the infosec, which will require to go back and do this due diligence. But also, it will require to clear the stigma of the tool being not appropriate, not fit for purpose, maybe not compliant. So it will, de and no one will refund the Copilot license. So it may result in one or maybe even few months of paying for license which you cannot utilize. So absolutely technical readiness and technical enablement is uh, is number one on the agenda. And there are three focus areas which we normally go in through and which we recommend to look into uh, from a tech readiness perspective. So first of all is permissions and oversharing. So you would like to assess permissions across the SharePoint and OneDrive. You would like to take a look into the sharing permissions across your, your teams and your sites, looking at your public teams or public sites, making uh, sure you look into the default sharing permissions. You would like to remediate any oversharing uh, issues that you may you may see, and you, you absolutely would like to make sure that the pilot group, who the users who you will assign license for the pilot, phase um, of the copilot that they are absolutely risk free. Probably even go uh, into like user by user from report perspective and making sure that OK, if I am including Carly in my pilot for for the copilot for next month, I would like to make sure that she will not be able to access information which was overshared accidentally uh, with her account. Then obviously looking into the license prerequisites. Yes, you will have to buy a copy of license, which is obvious, but you will also want to make sure that all the users uh, who are earmarked for the pilot group, they're correctly licensed with E3 or E5 license. They should have active uh, Enter ID, which is Azure ID uh, accounts, and the M365 tools have to be enabled. So 
OneDrive is a must have because that's a prerequisite for some of the basic functionality, but also in all the M365 tools where you will be driving adoption and doing all the use cases and testing, such as uh, Word or PowerPoint, Teams or Outlook or Loop, those tools have to be identified and enabled. If some of them are disabled by policies, like for example, Loop, uh, you may want to consider excluding this from your uh, change adoption uh, activities. And then finally, looking from a um, onto your environment from a perspective of risk and compliance, looking into data governance broadly, so not just addressing oversharing today as it stands, but also looking into how do you manage, how do you govern your data in the environment. Looking at things like sensitivity labeling, right? So which information should be uh, should be labeled as confidential, probably highly confidential. What are the data loss prevention policies uh, applied to this information? Right. What the um, what actions you should take if someone's trying to share a confidential file, for example. Of course, looking at the retention policies, retention labels to make sure that the corpus of data, the corpus of information, uh, which has been indexed by semantic index, is actually up to date, is relevant. So the information which is out of date, which is irrelevant, it will not be there and it will not confuse users by uh, popping up in results. And of course, looking into the data governance roadmap, like planning where the organization should be within like 6, 12, 24 months after today, because you would like to make sure that whatever AI tool, whatever technology you apply, today it will be bulletproof tomorrow because you have those guardrails. So that's just a step number one, uh, technical readiness from a perspective of utilizing the most out of the Copilot license during the uh, trial period. And of course, after this, we go into the adoption phase and I'm handing back over to Katie. You unmute Katie, I think. Happens all the Here time. Here we go. Me. Yes. <laughs> Didn't want to interrupt you, Ant. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. So, of course, once we have decided uh, we, we're licensing a portion of our organization, maybe we're doing that first 300 licenses or maybe more, we want to ensure that we're getting the most out of this. Perhaps we're even doing, you know, part of the EAP and we are testing to see if we think this is something we want to scale up across the organization. Um, so, if we just go to the next slide. Um, I want to take a step back and just think about what a successful co-pilot enablement looks like. That could be an EAP, it could be a pilot, it could be your first set of licenses, your first cohort. Um, and I guess there's kind of two key areas. One is driving adoption, and that's the first three areas. So if we just click out, we should select those first three areas. And we've got, um, if we think about the, the middle point here, pilot users or initial users understand the bounds of the tool, where it's usable at their company, and become advocates for that use. That's going to be critical to getting the most out of Copilot licenses that we do enable for our users. If we look over to the left hand side, the second is around this piece around prompt engineering, which I'll come back to in a moment. So users are empowered to use Copilot effectively due to the prompts that they give Copilot in the first place. And the third is that we want to manage the perception of Copilot and AI in the workplace. We all know that we use AI in our everyday lives. You know, people might have Alexa or or a, a, a kind of bot in their home. Uh, we're using it on our mobile devices um, and you know people are starting to use ChatGPT in their personal life. So we know that AI is out there in many guises. How do we manage this perception in the workplace so that you know we're not people don't feel concerned about job security, that they understand it's an enabler for them to be more innovative and creative. Those first three points are really around driving adoption and appropriate adoption, best practice adoption, that people understand the tool and what it can do for them. The second three bottom points I'm going to come on to in the measuring uh, impact um, and business case pieces that we spoke up um, our sort of third and fourth pillar. So just at a high level, those are around identifying key processes where Copilot could have impact, creating a business pay case to recommend how the company will move forward with AI and licensing and comprehensively measuring impact and ROI to be able to form that business case. So let's focus in on adoption first. This is what we think a successful sit first six, 12 months of Copilot looks like, that we've achieved these six different areas. Um, and these can take a more informal tone. So maybe the business case doesn't have to be as extensive. Your, you know, your senior leadership will sign off to say, yeah, we definitely want to do this. Um, 
but we need to consider them regardless. So let's focus in on adoption first of all. Um, so, you know, this, there's nothing extraordinary here. You know, you know, at WM, we're big advocates of, of having a robust change and adoption approach. Um, and, you know, those those come in, in the form of communication. So if we look right in the middle of this, this uh, visual, we believe that having a Teams channel um, for your co-pilot cohort is going to be critical to getting the right communications and messages to them, and the right top tips, any asks, if we are asking them to test or share feedback, um, let them know about the upcoming drop-in session. So one central place for everyone, whether that's 300 or 1,000 people, um, you know, we have that community where we can start to drive engagement. If you go beyond that into larger scale, obviously I have to think maybe a bit more tactically about function-based channels um, in order to support people so that we don't have as much noise. But at least in this early stage, we can get these people together so they can share the good, the bad and the ugly um, that they're getting back from Copilot and the downright funny. Um, and we can all learn from each other. Um, in our experiences. So having that central place is key. If you go over to the right hand side um, and go clockwise round, we've got self-service training materials. So actual materials that I can digest um, in any way that I can. This is not, uh, as I say, nothing profound here. A SharePoint hub, an area that has guides that have both angles. So we've got the angle of apps, i.e. Uh, the different application that I'm going into that surfaces uh, information from Copilot, so that might be Word or PowerPoint or Excel. So I focused in on app experiences, but then also scenario based training. So thinking about the day in the life of an individual in a different role. Then we've got videos and materials on that prompt engineering piece, FAQs and success stories in different roles, the share where Copilot is having an impact. So we want an area that is self-serve, that doesn't require people to attend a meeting or constantly be checking comms, that they know they've got an area for all the training materials they could possibly need. The next is more active kind of uh, in, in, you know, one to, not one to one, sorry, um, in, in person or on a Teams meeting training and drop in sessions. So we want to make sure we have dedicated briefings on each of the different apps, perhaps, and also uh, maybe function based training sessions. So I'm working directly just with legal or just with HR or just with supply chain, because some of the examples we share in the more general sessions won't resonate with them. We know that there'll be more specialised processes that happen in those departments that we want to articulate to them and, you know, hear more, more from them about how they work um, in order to uh, think about those scenario base. So again, we've got app and scenario. We want to always be coming at this from both angles. The next is around our champions or focus group, if we want to call it that. Um, we really want to have a dedicated focus group. So, you know, if we're looking at an EAP of, uh, or, a, or a pilot or an initial cohort of 300 people, we want to have a focus group of champions who are maybe about 30 people um, who are going to give us that real insight into the different role types at um, in their function. So we want to treat these guys with a bit of a white glove approach. Um, they will have some briefing sessions. Um, we will you know, create a more private area for them to share back and we will make some more asks of them. And I'll share a little bit more about gives and gets a little bit later on. But these guys are going to give us that role based insight that are going to help inform some of those scenario based training sessions and uh, materials that I spoke about on the right hand side. We need these people on the ground who are going to give us insight. We cannot get to know 300 people or a thousand people. We need a view of how this is landing in the business. Any challenges that are happening, a really proactive audience are gonna, who are going to help us out here. And then, of course, you will be looking at licensing a couple of senior stakeholders, I imagine, as well. Um, this community, unsur unsurprisingly, are the easiest to achieve ROI, given that the license cost is, uh, you know, the same across role types and salary levels. Um, but there'll be more nuanced ways in which these guys will use Copilot. There'll be some functions of Copilot around drafting and creating from scratch in Word that maybe they don't use, um, others that they'll use more effectively. So we need to understand the key areas of importance for each stakeholder that we might enable um, so that we can, in our small group and one-to-one -one support with them, um, we can make it real um, in their worlds. And then of course, you know, because of this, we wanna give direct access to uh, a project team member for these this audience. So once we've had a one-to-one -one or small group session, be able to, that person be able to reach out to us or their EA or PA also be able to reach out to us in chat um, and be able to support them ad hoc through this process as well. And we'll of course provide them and the champions with regular updates beyond what we'll give the whole uh, licensed audience because these guys are part and kind of part of the mechanics of, of driving adoption in this way. 
I doubt there'll be much kind of to surprise you on this slide. These are the, the, the key pillars of the way that we work um, and the way we advocate driving adoption, you know, using the, the ADCAR model and using these pillars of change. We think these are even more important than ever when it comes to co-pilot and realising the capability. You know, when we're working with something like Teams, it's something already in our licence and we're just trying to optimise our existing investment. This time we are investing more and outside of our existing modern workplace costs. So we need to be even more robust and diligent in our adoption pillars and really go to town on each of these to get the most out of it and drive the best practice approach that we want to. So moving on, we just drop onto the next slide. I just want to focus in on three key areas that I think are super important for the materials, the topics, the top tips, uh, the sessions that you're going to drive when it comes to uh, your adoption campaign. So if we click, we'll see um, a visual that's actually produced by Microsoft. So there's lots out there that Microsoft is already producing for you. Um, I just want to take a moment that I noticed yesterday <laughs> that the Oxford Dictionary uh, published their uh, words of the year. Um, the first word being Riz, which I didn't ever had never heard before, which uh, tells you that I'm definitely not Gen Z. Um, but in their top group of words was the word prompt in the context of AI. So prompt is one of Oxford Dictionary's word of the year because, of course, as we know, it's our it's our co-pilot, not our autopilot, and we need to give it enough information in the prompt to get the most out of the technology. I really love this little visual from Microsoft: the ingredients for a perfect prompt with goal, context, source, and expectation. Um, if you're UK based, that's a nice easy GCSE um, acronym to, rem to remember. Um, but, you know, rather than just putting in one line, how can we give Copilot each of these different you know, kind of areas of the goal, the context, the source and the expectation um, to get the most out of the technology? So we need to you know, get people up to speed with with prompting efficiently and effectively. Um, when I first got Copilot, I know my first few days, my prompts didn't get much back and I needed to add to them to get more from the technology. Some of you will know that over the first six weeks of having a co-pilot license, a process of semantic indexing happens in the background. So to throw a technical term in there, but all that means is that the technology is learning from you and understanding your, uh, your office graph and your interactions in the M365 space. So that when I ask it a prompt around you know, a particular finance report, it knows that it'll probably be someone in my network or in a team that I'm a part of, and it will give me back better and better results over those six weeks. What's nice about that process that we can and we should tell users about that process that's happening in the background when we give them licenses is that we can be doing that in terms of their capability over a similar period too. So the first six weeks is all about introducing them to each of the different apps where they can use Copilot, but it's also about introducing them to building a better prompt. And we think a real focus of adoption campaign should be on prompt engineering. So let's move on to the next focus area now. Um, and that is on app capabilities. So again, if we click, we will see a uh, an example of a guide that you can see here. Um, and this is the first, you know, rather than the kind of scenario base, we do need people to understand what the key capabilities in each app are. So this is in Teams meetings as an example. So catching up, summarizing, assigning actions are some of the key things that we know um, the tool it enables us to do. So we do need to do that focused effort on the different app capabilities. So in Word, in Teams meetings, in Teams chat, um, in Outlook. Of course, the one example that's a little bit different in terms of the UI experience is M365 chat. So with all the other apps, we can very easily say, OK, you can access the Copilot icon here. Uh, this panel on the right hand side will open up and here's the key prompts you can do in that area. M365 chat is the one kind of new experience where I'm not in situ. So that's one where we do need to encourage people to be pinning that to their left hand rail of teams um, and reminding it of all the key kind of the breadth of things I can ask it as well. So we do need to think about all of those different kind of surfaces we can get Copilot within and do some focused training and adoption work on each of those as well. And third, but absolutely not least um, in terms of focus area. And again, with a click, we should see um, uh, the user tasks and scenarios approach. And this is the day in the life asset that I was just talking about. So this is an example for IT, for Samira, who's analyzing tickets and data sets. Um, but we, we need to be thinking about materials across each of the different role types um, where, you know, their, their experiences with Copilot can be different. And you can see in this visual, we're weaving together some different tasks and actions that touch different ways Copilot can help. In Word, in M365 chat, in Excel, in Teams and in Word as well. 
So thinking about scenario based and process based is going to help people bring this to life. And that's why I recommend some assets like this and also um, you know, thinking about some functional based training sessions where we can really get into detail and in key processes that are going to resonate with that area. So those are some real headlines around adoption. Um, so as you can see, the key pillars, but we really recommend that these need to be as more robust than ever. And then thinking about adoption um, campaign, um, both in, you know, in, in the kind of three areas that are most critical, prompt engineering, um, tasks and scenarios, and the apps themselves and driving that capability um, and understanding of the in-app functionality. Great stuff, cool. So we've had to think about adoption. So that's our first two pillars done. Now let's have a think about measuring impact. Now, this is probably relevant to most people in some way or another. Some organisations, some senior leaderships will ask for more diligent and more detailed breakdown of where the impact is. They'll be asking maybe for ROI figures, um, really trying to understand um, where um, Popart is having an impact. So I'm not going to go through this slide in full. This is a view of like a whole project where adoption, measurement and business case are considered. But people might ask, where does measurement fit? So we've done some discovery and readiness and we've started to drive adoption. We need to be doing this and achieving good adoption levels in order to start working on the measurement piece. This representative focus group in the bottom right hand side, or you might be your champions group, are going to give us that insight um, into um, where and what tasks we can be can be measuring with and without Copilot in an A-B testing approach, and that can help lead to a business case. But we also will be helping to, uh, you know, thinking about surveying the whole community as well. So we've got various different data uh, sources, which I'll go into in a minute, but we need to be in a place where we've driven relevant adoption to start measuring. So that's where the kind of, and I think that's where the EAP process comes in from Microsoft. We want to be enabling people, driving some adoption, seeing where the impact is, measuring it, and then thinking about our next steps over the next 6, 12, 18 months of Copilot. Who should have a license? Where it's having impact? You know, can we justify the investment? Um, what are the ROI metrics? So if we skip onto the next slide. Um, so I just want to introduce, when we think about measurement, the gives and gets principle for Copilot. I think this is really critical. So. If we think about the give, the get that, that our people get um, with a co-pilot license, so they're going to have this team with regular comms, they're going to have an engaging launch campaign. You know, we are investing in this group of people um, when it comes to um, co-pilot. Um, they're going to get focused training, significant bank of training assets. Um, you know, they're going to have prompt engineering support, drop-ins, contribute to and learn from co-pilot success stories across the organisation. So they get a lot with this and we're investing in people. We need to in this first period of time, unlike maybe, a, as I say, like, a, a, you know, a Teams meetings rollout that you might have done uh, in the past. Um, you know, with, in those kind of changes, we are optimising what we already have and we already know that we want to do it. You know, there's an end goal on site, which is adoption across the whole organisation. A lot of you will be thinking, who do I licence? You know, do we roll this out or not? How do we scale this? And we need to be measuring um, and understanding the impact to do so. And therefore, we need to ask more of our initial audience than we would do on one of those other changes. So people need to give as a co-pilot initial cohort uh, user. They need there, there need to be some gives. So we need people who are going to use the tools in their role every day. Um, we also need them to complete and share feedback with us. And that's going to take the form in various ways. That will be survey based, A-B testing based. We need them to be people who are going to share who are going to give up some of their time to provide that feedback, to give us the insight we need to put a recommendation to move forward. So we need to make sure that when we land Copilot initially, that we've made this ask of people. We've said, you're going to get this, but there are some caveats to that. We need some things from you back in order for this process and programme to work well. Cool. Um, so if we just go on to the next slide, then let's start to think about those data gathering um, pieces. So if we click, well, we should get the first one, which is around the whole audience, not just the focus group or champions. So we need to be using surveys to uh, get to the whole organisation. We need to be um, understanding what everybody is thinking on a per app basis. So it might be that we spend a few focus weeks on each app at a time or it, you know, or two apps at a time and build that over two or three months to build that initial capability. And as we go every week or two or three weeks, we need some short, sharp surveys that are going to capture data, maybe using CSAT models, 
we can compare this to, we can look to some of the Microsoft uh, data sets that we'll see in a minute to see how to ask some of those questions as well. And these are going to be perception based, self professed from a user, and structured against key metrics. The next is all about that champion and uh, uh, like specific focus group audience. So we need to, to be really understanding those key scenarios. And something I really recommend doing is doing, doing some user interviews on ways of working with that group of sort of 30 out of the 300, sort of 10%. Um, you know, if we can you know, anywhere from 20 to 25 up to sort of 30 users for a 300 person um, cohort um, will be our focus group and they can help us we're not going to ask them particularly about their perception of Copilot at this early stage. We're going to be asking them uh, about their ways of working pre Copilot so we can map Copilot to their role based scenarios. And the next uh, area is around A B testing. So um, we are going to, once we've got those scenarios in place, one key thing that we can't do out of surveys is really actually measurably say, how do people work with and without Copilot? What is the time saving that will happen? So actually what we want to do with the user scenarios identified is test it with and without Copilot. We've got a whole process for this, which I'll go into a little bit in a minute, and we can obviously advise on this moving forward if you're interested. The other thing about data is that we have external data sources. At the moment, the key thing is the work index 2023 that's been published from Microsoft. So by doing this internal data collection during our initial cohort, we can use that to compare with the external. So if we're seeing stats of 70%, um, you know, more productivity in the Microsoft report, are we seeing that reflected in our organization or not, given the data sets that we have? So we're starting to get that measurable impact piece you know, is are the things that Microsoft are telling us around, um, you know, the impact this will have reflected in an organization. From my experience in the past couple of months, I would say they absolutely are, if not even even higher, the impact that we're seeing. But we want to do our due diligence and see, you know, how these stats measure up against our own experiences internally. <clears throat> Great stuff. So just thinking about some goals and, and metrics as well. So if we just click through all of these, Anton, and I'll speak through each of them. I think there are five. <clears throat> Great stuff. So um, the key things we need to, to be measuring on a per scenario basis are the number of users who will do this. So if we say, OK, um, you know, summarising team, a team's meeting, um, uh, the actions being summarised in a team's meeting using Copilot, OK, that's actually used by a large number of users in the organisation, and that's happening multiple times a day for everybody. So when we do attribute a time saving of 10 minutes versus manually, you know, we can do some calculations then based on the number of users and the frequency of use of where this impact is going to be had. And that will help us understand that that time saved will help us understand that ROI piece. But there's, the two at the top are really important as well. We want to look at quality of output and we want to look at user satisfaction. It's all very well Copilot saving us time, but what if the quality is not there? And it might dip in quality a little bit, you know, it's AI rather than a human impact. But if it saves me, um, you know, significant time and then I need to do some amends to the output at the end, um, but the quality is of a good enough standard that it really helps me with my role, um, that's really, really important. You know, and where do we find our satisfaction levels at the end of this as well? And then just a, a note on the A-B testing, which might, you might have not have executed before. Um, the, the kind of highlight of the process is, and again, if you want to talk to us about this in more detail, I can go into it, is that the interviewing with different users in different roles will help us identify the high importance tasks um, and job role specific tasks that Copilot can be used. We'll then schedule time with those uh, focus group or champions or even beyond that in the, the rest of the cohort to conduct A-B testing to test these real world situations because the data in the surveys we've already done is probably going to be more about functionality in app. We'll then have a call with them, introduce the A-B testing approach, ask, the ta ask them to complete the tasks um, with and without Copilot. And they'll, they'll undertake that without us monitoring them because we don't want that observer effect. But then we will connect with them afterwards to score the task completion against those key metrics of time taken, quality of output, cognitive effort required, task frequency, etc. So that's just a little highlight on measurement and starting to think about how we measure impact. And those are some ideas for you um, that we'd love to speak to you about, about how to take that forward in your organisation. So kind of fourth pillar now. Um, is around the business case. So I'll keep this brief. Um, you know, there'll be lots that we'll be learning about 
Um, and of course, we've just captured all of that key data that I've just discussed. And next step is really around the analysis of that data. How can we measure ROI um, against those defined metrics? Um, and how can we use the qualitative and perception based data from the whole cohort as well in order to form this business case where we have a clear understanding of the day to day tasks, uh, robust metrics um, in you know, time saving employee hours by average salary, um, analyze that data against role type and have a clear recommendation for next steps as well. And just to flash up um, some thoughts we have on the content that a business case might contain. Um, you obviously before we get started about kind of articulating this want to share around what the opportunity copilot has to offer and this might summarize the landscape of AI in the workplace it might say why copilot has come into being thinking about the work lab insights from microsoft that led to copilot's um, development we might talk about the investment level this is why we're doing such a robust approach to our our cohort um, and to this measurement piece um, and you know, levers that make uh, a business case and licensing decision. So what are we going to base our decision on? And then the five key areas we think are really important to focus on in a business case would be summarising the approach to date and how we've done this assessment, some data gathering um, approaches and metrics. So summarising how we've gathered data and, and making sure it's robust and valid. Um, some analysis of and this middle, this the kind of darker orange is probably the, the biggest portion of the pie here, which is an, analysing that data and driving insights that lead to the recommendations. And then industry and global insights and trends, um, you know, measuring up against externally published published data as well, and then any other enablers and considerations, and that will lead you to that recommendation and summary that can, you know, share with senior stakeholders. So that's that business case piece. Um, just want to share some headlines of you what we think that should and could contain in terms of content, um, and I think that takes us on to thinking into the future that recommendation and summary from a, a licensing and adoption perspective. But I want to pass back to Ant now for our fifth and final pillar around extensibility and planning for extensibility in the future. Thanks, Katie. Yes, extensibility. Uh, I know that's probably not the not the top of mind of a lot of our customers today because everyone is so focused on thinking how do we sort out our environment, how do we make sure we're technically um ready to deploy the copilot and how do we drive user adoption but then if you think a little bit further you you may want to understand how and why should you extend your copilot capabilities and let's dig a little bit deeper into why you can do this but first of all let's see what is accessibility so as you know M365 Copilot is operated with data within M365. And there are two ways how do you can extend this corpus of knowledge almost. The first one is extending the user skills pillar, uh, which is developing plugins for your Copilot. So if your data or if, you, if you're using any other system, for example, Cooper or SuccessFactors, it's not connected by default to M365. But if you would like, use it to retrieve keyword um, like search information by keywords from the third party system and perform actions you can consider development plugins for copilot so the main aspects here is retrieval information via api from the third party system and performing actions on user behalf and then on the other on the other end it's extending organizational knowledge making sure that you can ingest the information from line of business system into the m365 so it become becomes available for semantic index and it could be picked up by search and by m365 copilot so you will see you will be also able to retrieve uh, keyword search information using m365 copilot you will not be able to execute actions because as soon as you ingest this information into the m365 say from sap the link between the index in m365 and sap breaks so you will not be able to act with graph connectors uh into sap but you what you will be able uh to do is because this whole information becomes integrated into your uh into your knowledge organization knowledge you should be able to reason upon this information with um with better uh, kind of ideation uh requests and similarities around the index content uh, performing analysis as well the two ways 
how you can currently do this. And a Copilot Studio is one of the one of the ways how to implement plugins, but it still falls into those two uh, those two pillars. So why are we talking about planning for accessibility today uh, within this webinar? So first of all, as you know, like not always, like most of the times, not all the data is within M365, right? Most the organization that we ever worked with, and we as a, as a company were not exception to the rule. There are a lot of data sources sitting outside of M365, whether it's a planning software, whether it's um, uh, a system on to manage your, your invoices, to manage your payments, ex, uh, expenses, HR, payroll, it's usually outside of sitting outside of M365. But since you're investing into M365 Copilot, you like to make sure that Copilot can actually reach to all those systems and you can actually perform your day-to-day -day tasks within the single tool, with a single AI assistant and not hop in between applications. A lot of those applications will actually offer um, AI capability, probably again with another additional um, license level, another SQ. But because the nature of AI and nature of large language models is quite expensive, they're very expensive uh, things to run just on a hardware level, just to compute the next tokens is pretty energy inefficient. So there will be like how I call it AI tax applied by all the systems. And if you have this, if you're paying for AI functionality in Microsoft, then you will pay this for your SAP solution, for service now solution, you will pay this AI tax in multiple different systems for multiple providers. Uh, it's not going to be sustainable and it's going to be pretty costly. So what you can do is actually plan for a unified ecosystem where you have the LLM uh, applying its intelligence once in a single place, but still grabbing information from all the from all the systems. We know and we've seen this from Ignite that the majority of the big vendors such as SAP or again ServiceNow, they already developing their plugins, uh, which will be available for Copilot. Um, some of them available today, like Jira. Uh, some of them will be available next year, and you would like to plan based on your ecosystem based on your technical landscape, which of those plugins you would like to, you have to enable uh, to make sure that the user journeys are completed seamlessly, again, without switching context, context. And that's your end goal. That's the end goal of many, you know, uh, science fiction books or um, my imagination at this way. You can go into the single assistant and perform your tasks end to end without leaving the conversation. So my goal would be to um, to be able to drop a prompt like, OK, next week I'm visiting our office in Milan. I'm visiting a K11 building to meet with my colleague Marcello. Uh, hey, Copilot, could you please book my flights, book my accommodation, which will be covered by uh, our expense policies and also could you book a desk next to Marcello and it will be nice if you can find the closest available meeting room from 11 to 12 and book it for two of us. And if the system will be able to understand this prompt, break it down into multiple intents and call specific plugin Right, then you should be able to do this like this within a probably two minutes of writing prompt and maybe like one minute uh, just confirming the intent, the confirming the actions by um, Copilot instead of you know, you basically know how it works today, right? You have to go to multiple systems. If you don't have personal assistant, of course, you go to multiple systems. So you book in these things yourself and then you compare in available dates. So you have to go and maybe change your bookings. So that's the end goal. That's the North Star. Um, how do you plan 
for accessibility, that's the, the typical three steps, um, how we approach any, almost any software development with a little bit of twist. So first of all, going into discovery, right? Collecting those use cases with your leadership or with your representative focus group, like what are the most time consuming use cases today? Identifying the line of business systems which are connected um, and which are being used by your employees. And then with all this knowledge, we can go into the proof of concept stage before completing the end to end design. We can use low code, no code facilities like Copilot Studio to quickly create a proof of concept, making sure that yes, it's actually feasible. The APIs, the endpoints are all there. So yes, we can deliver this. And then based on this, you can understand cost implications and you can design architecture the final solution and then ultimately going into the build phase so you will be developing the extensibility or maybe not even development maybe you will uh during the poc phase you will understand okay some of those plugins already available from the vendors and you can already make them available for copilot co for the end users so you don't have to do this those bits but maybe for some of those um, steps you will have to develop custom plugin, which is going to bespoke API or maybe doing some complex computations because we know LLMs are good for kind of text based tasks, but when you're going into numbers or specifics, they may not be the solution. So you may do this in your plugin. And you can also, while developing, you can optimize the, the system prompts on the plugins in a way that it makes it easier for the end users to actually uh, type their prompts so they don't have to do any weird things with keywords or tweaking their prompts so they can be pretty straightforward doing this in their natural language. And just one of the examples of the of the approach that is available for the discovery is the uh, M365 Copilot workshops which are available uh, from Microsoft, their funded workshops. Um, so if you're interested, you can always reach out to your Microsoft client or um, to us at WM Reply where we can help you understand whether you're eligible and if yes, how do we structure it better to not only uh, do the technical assessment and showing you out of the possible, but also understanding the use cases will which way um, impact the future extensibility. So that's our five pillars done. And I know we're aiming for 30, 35 minutes of content. And as usual, we, uh, we went um, above. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in Q&A box. I think we, uh, we may actually not have any questions. Um, Carly, do you have anything on your end? Nothing on my end, guys. Amazing, which means that probably myself and Katie would deliver the content in a, in a very clear way leaving no doubts and no questions. So <laughs> saying this, um, I would like to thank you all for joining and being with us uh, during this webinar series. I hope all of them together gives you a quite clear understanding on at least how to how to approach Copilot readiness, adoption um, and planning for future and actually do this in a very um, efficient way. So thanks uh, for being with us. We were developing those webinar um, across multiple months and we know the product was evolving. So hopefully it still hits all the base, cover all the bases today. So thanks for this. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us um, via the email or just hello at hello wm at reply.com uh, and yeah all the webinars available on our youtube channel so thanks everyone thank you so much amazing afternoon thanks for joining thanks. us thank you thank bye you bye bye bye